All right, good to see everybody this morning. I heard the bell downstairs. I think we're ready to roll. So today, believe it or not, we, we are done with 1 Timothy. Next week, let me get the outline up there for you. I'm technically challenged right now. There we go. Yeah, next week, May 8th, we start 2 Timothy, and basically we do a chapter a week for the rest of the quarter, uh, getting through 2 Timothy. So uh, chapter one, essential instructions next week, and then strength and endurance, danger ahead, and then Paul's farewell. So tonight, or tonight, oh boy, have, am I Ben Coyle in reverse? Um, anyway, this morning, <laughs> we're looking at the end of uh, the, Paul's first letter to Timothy, and I, I really love the the ends of Paul's letters. And I I think for me, it's just a, you know, it's kind of what I like in life too, just kind of the nuts and bolts, just kind of the, okay, we've, we've, we've had this content, which is of course fabulous, but then it's it's like boom, boom, boom. Let's just, let's list a lot of things off. Uh, Paul does it at the end of Romans, um, first and second Corinthians, to some some letters more than others. But it's always nice summary statements. It makes it personal as well with, obviously this whole letter is just a one person. So this whole letter, both of these letters, very, very personal. But like with the churches to Galate, to the church at Ephesians, you know, the, the personal greetings and those kinds of things. It just makes it, it makes us realize and maybe able to go back into that time a little bit and, and just, you know, almost feel like we're there. Okay, he's, he's addressing this person and that person. And, and it's just, it's really, really cool. So I, I love the end. I love this, what we're going to look at today. And the whole idea you can see in the title that uh, the gospel advocate, Chad Ramsey, put on this is seeking godliness. And I'm actually going to start after we have an opening prayer. I'm going to start with the application because in his application, Chad Ramsey kind of gives us an overview of what this whole ending is and really what the book has been. And uh, I think it's really, really good. Josh, I was surprised to see you walk in. Great to see you. Congratulations. We now, how's Nicole this morning? Okay, Ty tired, come on. She's been laying in bed for a bit. <laughs> so anyway, we're very, very thrilled. Very, very nice. So let's all, let's pray together. Father, we thank you so very much for these opportunities to uh, come together and, and study the Bible. Uh, Father, we do thank you so very much that, uh, that Nicole had a, a safe delivery and that uh, Abigail's fine. And Father, continue to, to bless that whole family and, and be with them. And uh, Father, we just uh, we praise you for all the gifts you give. And, and Father, I'll of course, one of the greatest is life itself. And we thank you for our physical lives. We thank you for the spiritual life that we have in Christ. And Father, may we always give you the glory, praise, honor, and thanksgiving for what you do. Now bless us as we study your word at this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So here's that application. Let's just go ahead right to that. So normally and obviously in your booklets, this is at the very end. But I think it is a good lead in as well. Godliness should characterize the life of the Christian. Those who seek to live in a manner pleasing to God will not be driven by greed or lust, it should say. Instead, they will run from sin and seek righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness. This does not mean rejoicing the world, rejecting the world will be easy. It is a fight. Nevertheless, the God we serve deserves our best efforts. Like Timothy, we must remain faithful to the good confession we made when we obeyed the gospel. And when we get to it, and of course, everything here is true uh, that, that Chad wrote, but I think it's worth noting in that last sentence, the good confession we made when we obeyed the gospel should be repeated over and over and over again. I was just talking with someone uh, this week about um, people, well, maybe even a non-Christian who, you know, how, how hard do we push at any given time? How hard, I mean, because we are talking life and death. We're talking eternity. We're talking heaven and hell. 
And so how, how hard do we push? How, how much oomph do we put behind our presentation of the gospel and our urging and our pleading with people to come to Christ? Or it could be someone who's drifted. You know, how, how hard do we go into that? And, and we, we had a little bit of a discussion and, and pretty much kind of the, the, uh, the it depends on the person kind of thing. I've got some people in my life, and I have shared this with you before, who are on kind of a list of one phone call a year. And what I shared with this individual I was with on uh, Thursday or Friday was I do try when I make that the one phone call a year. And of course, with some, it, it's become kind of a, a, a little humorous thing. The person will answer the phone and say, oh, this is my one phone call a year, isn't it? And I said, yes, it is. And, you know, we chuckle, 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 you know, small talk for a little bit. And then it's, yes, this is the one phone call for the year, but, but the reason I'm making it is because it's serious, you know, and I try to, but one thing I try to do is make sure that I make the good confession. I really think there's power in saying, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And I, I think that's important somehow in the conversation, even if it's an annual one, uh, Brandon will bring up in his lesson, his sermon this morning. Of course, we don't know if we have another year, but, but with something, you know, to, to, to push any harder, you know, we don't want to drive people away. And for some that are on my list, and I'm sure you guys have lists, they may not be written out, but in your brain, people that you're really worried about, um, their salvation, um, you know, you, you know, I don't want to ever get to the point with any of them where they say, you know what, Clay, please don't call back. I'm not going to take your calls anymore. You know, that kind of, you, we don't want it to get to that point. So it's tough. It takes wisdom. It takes uh, discernment. And I'm not saying I'm all wise and have the answers for this at all, but it, for all of us, it takes wisdom and it just takes, you know what, I'm just going to kind of put this in God's hands and, you know, and I'll, I'll keep doing the little nudges. And we'll just see how see how it goes. But uh, it's a tough thing. But I think that good confession, we need to, of course, we make it when we're first brought to Christ. We That's what faith is all about at its core, at its foundation, is belief that Jesus is the Son of God. And so we must, though, still continue, I think, to confess that as, as often as possible. I, I just think there's tons of power in that. When I read John 4, uh, Jesus and the woman at the well... When it gets to the point where Jesus, I'm not going to be able to say it. I mean, when it gets down to the point where Jesus says, I who speak to you am he. Oh, I mean, goosebumps from head to toe, like right now. Um, it's just unbelievable. And so the confession is a, a very powerful thing. And I think uh, just as the word of God is powerful, active, like a two-edged sword, our confession, our confession is part of the word. Our confession is part of the declaration of God to mankind. And I think it's important that that piece, it, I'm not going to say it's the most important piece, but it's a very important piece. And the, the more often we claim it and say it and not be ashamed of it, I think, I think the better. Yeah, Susan, go ahead. Yeah, the, the, these, these people, a, a lot of these people on my list would be people I grew up with. I mean, they know where I stand. You know what I mean? So there's, there's no, there's, the, so it's kind of a different situation than if I met someone at Kroger today and they, they saw um, my little Clay Brown, I'm a minister badge. <laughs> I don't have one, but um, we're at a hospital. A lot of times before when the hospitals were more open, and by the way, they are opening back up some, which is, I mean, pretty much haven't been, haven't, haven't had resistance uh, lately. Um, but um, in those kind of settings, it, it becomes clear pretty quick what I do for a living. So sometimes the conversations come up. Um, and that would be different. Yeah, you, you would have to know where someone is now. But even with, you know, I think, Susan, even with an atheist, it doesn't hurt for them to know what I believe. Because my stating that is not necessarily, I mean, eventually I would want them to come to have the same belief. But, um, but you know, God works in mysterious ways. And I just, I think it's worth even an atheist hearing, you know, hey, there's a guy, and he's not totally cuckoo. There's a guy, and he believes, he believes 
in this stuff. He believes that Jesus is the son of God. So does that, I don't know if I'm really answering what you're asking, but yeah, I, I still think you can start with Jesus because Jesus, no one denies even the, the staunchest atheist at an, an Ivy League school or something, no one would deny his existence. Everyone believes that Jesus was here. And, and his, so, I mean, so even that, I mean, I, you, I mean, and I'm just thinking out, my, my example was totally not in a conversion mode, but these, these call where, I, of course, I want it to be a conversion situation eventually, or a bringing back. A lot of them are people who have slipped away from the church. Um, and uh, we might label them prodigal. So, yeah, so go ahead, George. I, th I, I think that's great. Yeah, one step at a time, just one little thing. To, it, and you never know. Sometimes that turns into a full-blown conversation. Sometimes it, you know, it, a lot of times, even with Jesus, a lot of times things didn't go anywhere. You know, we, we can't let that discourage us from still putting out there the truth and putting out there uh, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God or what, you know, that these conversations, I'm not, I'm kind of, kind of one step at a time or going the right, or going in the right order. You know, I'm not going to talk to a person that doesn't believe in God about, you know, you really should be taking the Lord's Supper every Sunday. You know, there, there are things where there's a progression. Um, but I, I do think we can start right with Jesus, perhaps. But, but sometimes if someone's just, you know, if they're, if they're just a denier, then that could be a separate list. That could be a list of, here's someone that I met in my life. This person's a total denier. Um, I'll, I'll pray occasionally for this person. There's a, there's a whole stewardship of time. There's just, it, there's so much to put into it. And, um, and, and where, you know, don't cast your pearls before swine is a passage that comes to mind where, okay, how much time? Cause we only have so many hours in a day. We only have so many time. We only have so much time we can pray. You know, I don't know how many of us spend an hour in prayer a day. I mean, I don't, there's an occasional day where maybe it ends up being an hour if you would add it all up. But that's tough. So you have you have 60 minutes, maybe, and, and probably most of us don't have 60 minutes. And okay, where am I going to spend the minutes? I mean, Jennifer, Jared, Katie, and Josh have to be my first minutes. However minutes, however many minutes they get. And then I go to the elders. And then, as you guys know, I flip through old, the archaic printed directories. <laughs> <laughs> and just slowly go through that as far as people prayers. Um, and, you know, but how much time do we have? You know, it, it takes me a full week to get through our directory, usually. Uh, sometimes not. Sometimes in four days, you might get a prayer every four days. Uh, but, <laughs> but uh, and then uh, some of you, believe me, I'm praying every single day. <laughs> but, uh, but it's just, it's hard, isn't it? I mean, Susan, you know, because you think about these things. I know it's, it's tough to know you know, how to, you know, be good stewards of our time. Stewardship and wisdom. We talked about two weeks in a row. I, I plopped those words up on the screen. Stewardship and wisdom. And it, it's tough. But I think proclaiming the good confession is always a, a decent thing to do with someone who's drifting, at least. Yeah, Rick. Yeah, well, and of course, our labels that our society and our, yeah. But you're correct. If you're not for me, you're against me, you know, concerning Christ. Own words. So yeah, that, that's fabulous. And you're right that we just need to, and, and Paul, that's a, that's a different situation. That's a, that's a deeper conversation with a, with a very tip of, this might get more at what you were saying, Susan, Rick brought up um, Paul at the Areopagus and the fact that he, you know, he pointed out, you know, hey, you have an unknown, you have this, uh, this altar to an unknown God. That's where I'm gonna start. I'm gonna tell you about this unknown God. And so finding out where people are and, and going with them, you know, from what they believe forward is, you know, I think uh, obviously the way to go um, with, with, with trying to make converts. So anyway, great. Thank you for all the comments, every one of you. So this is the application so we could uh, dismiss, but we won't do that. So, okay, let's, um, let's dive into our text here. So um, there are four sections uh, today. No, normally, as you know, in these booklets, it's divided into three, uh, but this time, uh, four of them. The first one, uh, respecting the word in 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 6. And again, these divisions, we've talked about it. They're pretty arbitrary. In fact, the ESV, <laughs> uh, verse 6 going into verse 7 is the same sentence, but the way the 
uh, the booklet breaks it down. Uh, we're stopping at the end of verse six here, but we'll note uh, that it leads right into verse seven, obviously. So if anyone teaches a different doctrine and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. So let's pause there. We've got someone teaching a different doctrine. Uh, immediately, a lot of you are in the Galatians class on Wednesday nights. Um, I thought um, uh, Jason did a great job explaining that, that really hard passage, the really, really graphic passage of, you know what, if someone's teaching a different gospel, I wish, you know, if someone wants circumcision, I wish they'd go all the way and emasculate themselves. So, I mean, pretty graphic, pretty unbelievable, but that's what we have here, a different doctrine, something that is not in line with the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teaching that accords with godliness. So the words of our Lord Jesus Christ go right along with godliness and, of course, go along with a doctrine that is secure and foundational. And so that's what we want to do. This is contemplating someone who doesn't. And again, this is Paul writing to Timothy. Timothy's in Ephesus. He's a leader in the church there, a leader in that congregation. And Paul has given him some pretty tough teachings. You know, this is how it needs to be. And putting a lot of weight on Timothy, young Timothy, we might say, um, you know, make sure this is the way everything goes. And so he says, if anyone teaches something different, it automatically, if it's different, it's not in accord, it does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it does not agree with and go along with um, teaching that accords with godliness. If that's the case, he is puffed up with conceit and understands nothing. He has an unhealthy craving for controversy and for quarrels about words, which produce envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and constant friction among people who are depraved in mind and deprived of the truth, imagining that godliness is a means of gain. But godliness with contentment is great gain. So you have the, you have the false teachers who think, okay, if we do these certain things, it's a means of gain. I'll, I'll be able to profit from this. And look at all the nasty stuff that's involved in there. I will point out, and Brandon does in his sermon today, um, the, um, the quarrels about words. And we, and Rick and I have had conversations after the Tuesday morning class more than once and at other times about language and just how our, our culture loves to take a word and just twist it and mangle it. And, and so it really makes it hard to communicate. It makes it hard to communicate with someone on religious matters or even on just good versus evil because there are so many different ways people are using the words. And so to define ourselves and to make sure we're being clear is, is super important. Um, Brandon won't bring up this part in the sermon, but he was talking to us uh, maybe our staff meeting a week or two ago and talking about how since English is his second language, he, 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 from his perspective, he takes the English language more seriously than those of us that have it as the first language. And he, he feels a lot of times we, and he's not talking about us in this room, necessarily, but just English speakers. And he says he's probably the same way with Italian since that was his first language. He's probably a little sloppier with it, but with English, he, he tries to be super precise and, and he wants to hear precision, but obviously he's not getting much precision. Um, now he gets good precision from Greg, uh, Landon and I, uh, but anyway. So, but, but he, he takes it very seriously, the idea of language and words. And the, the, the most important thing is that we communicate. That's the most important thing. We need to communicate with people. So if we need to use a word that they like to use, then I, you know, hey, become all things to all people so that by any means we may save some, you know, the, the, the actual words coming out of our mouth, as long as it is communicating what we need to communicate, that's the key. So for me, Daniel, Mr. French, we were, the, the, the song we sang at the end of worship in second and first service had a do in it. So I, I thought I was back watching Beauty and the Beast. I'm just, I'm kidding with you totally, Daniel. But anyway, so we had a little bit of French in our singing this morning, um, 
but we all understood it, so it's okay. We, we understand what it means to bid adieu. And it rhymed with true, I think, in the next verse. <laughs> so anyway, as long as there is communication, then that is good. And I, I shouldn't say that just in a blanket way. I, I do think, hopefully, if we're talking with someone who has different meanings for words, we can pull them to the godly meanings of the words. I, I do think there's obviously word with a capital W. <laughs> there, there's really deep gravity with word, with communication, with declaration which is what that's about. So th these people that are off and teaching weird stuff, they like the little qu quarrels about words. They like controversy, envy, dissension, slander, evil suspicions, and on and on we go. And it's just a mess. We just want to speak the truth and obviously speak it in love. But notice the contrast, and this leads into the next section. The contrast is they think that they're, they can by messing with the gospel, they believe that they can have gain or profit from that. And then Paul says to Timothy, but godliness with contentment is great gain. That's where you get the gain. That's where you really profit when you are godly and when you're content. And so those, I, I love the concept of contentment, of peace, of wholeness. I, I love these concepts as we move through scripture. That peace in the Old Testament, and, and of course that was the Jewish meaning leading into the new, but uh, it's, it's the idea of wholeness. If you have peace, it means you're complete, you're whole. Things are the way they ought to be, at least from a spiritual uh, standpoint. Okay, so the next section. So godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing, with these we will be content. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. So let's go back up to the top for just a second. So one reason that godliness and contentment is great gain is because, and this requires a perspective that someone in Christ would have, um, but it requires a perspective of, of what he says next, for we brought nothing into the world. We can't take anything out of the world. So we should be content with whatever we have around us. If we get obsessed with worldly gain, if we get obsessed with things, um, if we, if all we worry about are things that we wear and things that we eat and things that we drink, as Jesus put it in the Sermon on the Mount, yeah, you know, we're going to be in, we're going to be in trouble. But we need to seek things that are that are higher and and better. So wherever you know, it's it's amazing how we fall into a place in this life, and uh, I. I, you know, I'm very thankful that we live in an age with air conditioning. Um, I, I just think that's fabulous. Of course, I wouldn't have known any different if I was born in the 1400s or whenever. But I, I appreciate the time in which we are. Um, but we need to do the best we can with it. We need to be good stewards. Again, wisdom and stewardship. Uh, so important. Um, we oftentimes said it, but it's, it's worth saying again. And, and someone may watch this years from now even. But notice that it's not money that is the root of all kinds of evils. It is the love of money. And so it's the obsession. It's, it's what is my idol? What is my God? What, what is the most important thing in my life? And if, if my love is for money, and, and I don't think it would be unfair to Paul and to the Holy Spirit and to God to say the love of any material goods, whatever the money might be, I mean, money in some years were, were chickens. You know, money has been different things as far as trading and bartering and, and dealing with things. So I, th I think it's okay to say the love of material goods is a root of all kinds of evils. But particularly here, it does say money. And so uh, that's what the Bible says here. But if we get obsessed with anything besides God, we're going to be we're going to be in trouble. So uh, go ahead, Susan. So, which is brotherly love. So, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, great. Thank you, George. 
So, which was used obviously not just for love between brothers, but just that kind of love. So anyway, yeah, very good. Thanks. Thanks, George. So, so the love of money. So it's not agape love. And it would, I don't know, that would be an interesting little study. See if agape is ever used of an inanimate object. Um, I don't think so. Probably I would, my guess would be not, but I guessed something else earlier in this quarter concerning the Greek and I was wrong when I looked it up that leak. <laughs> so I, I, I won't make a huge guess here, but agape love almost it typically is of God toward us. And then obviously we are to emulate that. So we are to have that kind of love uh, for others and for God. Um, but it would be interesting to know if agape is ever used of something like money or something like that. That would just be an interesting study. So someone do that before we dismiss because <laughs> we are capable these days of doing that. Yeah, Paul, go ahead. Um, yeah, the, the story of the rich young ruler. Um, Jesus told him what to do. Sell all that you have, give it to the poor. And, uh, and then all of that leading into follow me. And uh, he, he went away uh, kind of sad. We don't know in the long run what happened, but it, it sure looks like he didn't want to do that and uh, probably walked away. So yeah, really, that's a great example, Paul. And he, um, he apparently loved his stuff and uh, wasn't willing to give it up. So anyway, um, just the last line on this slide, and then we'll move to the next uh, section. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. And I think that's super telling for us. It's, it's not a pleasant thing. It, it may seem pleasurable. You know, um, you know Moses was uh, commended for not being obsessed with the pleasures of sin for a season. You know, he was, he was willing to leave Pharaoh's house. Um, but a lot of people don't. They're not willing. And, uh, and so they pierce themselves. Again, they may not feel it. They may not even know it's happening in this life. But they pierce themselves with many pains when someone has this craving and walks away from the faith. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing to look at. Uh, where do we put our time? Where do we put our money? Um, even, you know... Where do we put our prayers? Where do we put um, our thinking? Uh, God cares about our thoughts. What are the things we think about? What, what runs through our minds uh, over and over and over again? That's it's very important stuff. Rick, did you have a comment too early? Okay. Okay, so, the, um, so respecting the confession, and we already talked about the confession quite a bit right at the beginning, and I think it's just hugely important. This is a little different take, or not a different take, but um, obviously Paul is giving Timothy very specific instructions here um, and way more than just, just a talk about the confession. But as for you, O oh man of God, flee these things. So what's he talking about? The dissensions, all the trouble, the love of money, the false teaching. He's telling Timothy, you know, get away from all that junk that I've been talking about and instead pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. And the pursue verb, uh, which is imperative, it's a command, pursue, it is strong, just like fight. So the, the Bible, I, I love how the different words used and the, and the concept throughout scripture is engagement and seriousness about faith. Faith in fact, James says, faith without works is dead. You know, if, you, if your faith isn't, it doesn't have some passion and some oomph behind it, if your faith doesn't have a life behind it, then it's not real faith. It's just, you know, it's whatever. But if it's real faith, we're going to be pursuing. We're going to be moving. If we're really living for Christ, we're going to fight. We're going to be, we're going to have that oomph behind us. We're going to be moving and running for the Lord. So we need to do that with righteousness, godliness, with our very faith, with our love, steadfastness, and gentleness. So that's what we need to do. And that really all is part of fighting the good fight of the faith. And so we, we pursue these things. That, that would be a great prayer for today um, or for the week, if you want a prayer from this, this text for the week. God, I pray that I will flee all the negative things that are in my life, and particularly God, help me to never 
set up material things as my God. Help me never to uh, love money more than you, Father. Help me, because I know it's impossible to love both God and mammon or money. So God, help me to flee from all the things in my life that are negative. And God, help me to pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. I mean, a, a 90 second prayer. Start every day with that, maybe this week. You know, again, it, it's, it, it's your spiritual life. That is just something you could do if you're feeling a little weak right now, if you're feeling like you need a little pick me up. Talk about six great attributes to be pursuing. And then try to put them into practice. Um, fight the good fight of the faith, Paul says to Timothy. Take hold. So we've got pursuit. We've got fighting. We've got taking hold. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You know, one of the greatest ways that we confess in unison is when we sing. And another way we confess and proclaim that's a, a little more, I don't want to say esoteric, a, a little more from a, maybe a spiritual standpoint is the fact that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. That's a form of confession as well. Now, what, the confession typically in the New Testament, that is with our lips out loud. And so I don't want to take anything away from that. I think it's important for people to hear things. I think it's important for people to hear uh, statements of faith, to hear the word of God. I think it's great that we read scripture, every worship, and obviously all, our, all of our sermons, all of us are deep believers uh, in the word having power. And so, you know, hopefully every sermon you ever hear in this building will be very Bible-centered. Um, but, but pursue, fight, take hold, and, uh, and confess. And so he did that in front of many witnesses. I, I love that we, you know, we, we confess as we said, we worship is a fabulous thing. Don't, you know, don't ever forget how awesome it is to come together into the gathering, into the, the, the presence of God's family uh, to worship God almighty. It's an amazing thing. So this, this section goes a little bit, this is a, the, the biggest one of the four, uh, how uh, the, the booklet divides it up. So, you know, he's already given Timothy many charges, but now he says specific, specifically, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus. So in the presence of God and in the presence of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession Again, the woman at the well, all the different times Jesus confessed who he was, it's just, it's overwhelming. It's just unbelievable. I love it. Um, and for me, that's particularly emotionally powerful. You, I, we all have our different things that are particularly emotionally powerful to us. But that's, this, this is powerful to me, this whole idea of confession. So Jesus made it. So I'm charging you, Timothy, in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the rest of your life, right? Um, until Jesus comes back, you know, keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. And then the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. And then really, we might call this a doxology. This is just a, a, a praise, a, a praise to God, almost a, we, we could sing this line. Um, he who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. And of course we do sing that uh, oftentimes. Who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor, and eternal dominion. Amen. I mean, what an amazing, and you know, uh, you know, for me, it's like, okay, this letter could end right there, right? I mean, that's just unbelievable. That is so powerful. Um, but that's who, that's who our God is. That's who our Lord is. 
uh, and that's who we serve. And it's just, it's quite incredible. And hopefully all of us feel the gravity of it and the, the majesty of our Lord. Uh, we, we worship the great one. We worship the good one. We worship the loving one. We worship the one who's defined as truth. We worship the one who is all grace. I mean, just, you know, and we worship the one who is all judgment. All these things of God in their perfection. Absolutely incredible. This is who we serve. This is who we have amazingly been made a part of in Jesus Christ. Um, and then the, any, anyone want to add anything there or um, make any comment there? Okay. Then teaching them. So we end with uh, this statement. So he's already talked about the love of money being the, a root of all kinds of evils leading to all kinds of trouble. Um, and then he, he gives them, he gives Timothy a charge to give to the rich. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. So earthly gain and spiritual or godly gain, obviously, are two totally different things. And even the rich, and maybe especially the rich, are to make sure they keep that distinct. So charge them not to be haughty. Um, and the, I mean, obviously it's all huge, but if their hopes are on their riches, that really is parallel to the love of money. And that is unacceptable. So they don't want to, you don't want to, all of us, none of us want to pin our hopes on what we have. We need to pin our hopes. We need to uh, grab hold of and rely on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. And this, I already referenced the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus talks about, you know, the, the world, they're running after things that you eat, things that you drink, things that you wear. We're to seek first the kingdom. There's a whole different perspective when we are in Christ. And he provides. We, and, and this is not talking, Paul's not talking to Timothy and saying, who provides us with everything to enjoy in the next life. I mean, he's just pointing, you know, if we're in Christ and if we're content, which is where this all started, you know what? We're going to have the joy of the Lord. We are going to enjoy. We are going to be, and I think contentment, they're not the same. Contentment and joy are not synonyms, but they sure go hand in hand from a spiritual standpoint. If someone is content, they're probably going to be a joyful person. If someone's a joyful person, they're probably going to be content. And so anyway, the, Paul is pointing out to Timothy, you know what? You know, God is providing. God is providing. He's pouring out his blessings. Uh, what else are the rich to do? They are to do good, and they are to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. You know, we, the stuff of this world, yeah, maybe, you know, we're, we're part of it. We're, we're, we're moving through this life. We have to deal with the things we have to deal with in this life. Uh, but true life is spiritual life. Our true home is heaven, not here. Very, very important for us to keep the perspective. And then the letter ends with these verses. Oh, Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. So he still uses a financial term. Guard the deposit. You, God has richly blessed you. He has deposited within you. Uh, I, I think uh, Paul at, at least is alluding to the Holy Spirit. Uh, it could be salvation. Brandon uses uh, 2 Timothy 4 in his sermon this morning, which I absolutely uh, love. And, um, and it, it talks about the treasure within us. And Paul doesn't define it for the Corinthians. It could be salvation. It could be the Holy Spirit. It could be Christ. Obviously, all those things go hand in hand. They go together. But the Corinthian church and all Christians, we have received a treasure. The Spirit is specifically called a deposit in other places. So that, that's where I lean. But O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. Avoid the irreverent babble and contradiction of what is falsely called knowledge. 
for by professing it, some have swerved from the faith. So again, he gets back to these false teachers, these things that are going wrong uh, there in Ephesus where Timothy is. And then the final, uh, the final blessing, grace be with you. And grace be with all of us here today. So yeah, Adam. Yeah, that, that is awesome. A great, great thing to point out for our end. Yeah, the, um, the uncertainty of riches is, I mean, might be, I mean, it's, it's probably always been evident, you know, for the, for the uh, 6,000 years of, of history we have written for us in the Bible. But, uh, the, um, but right now, of course, in anyone's present day, it probably seems more potent. Um, and so, yeah, we certainly see that. And, but as Adam said, the, uh, there is certainty in spiritual riches. There is certainty in God and in Christ. And that, that is absolutely uh, awesome. So um, next week, we will start 2 Timothy, finally. And uh, the, um, the, the text in the booklet is verses 3 through 18. And I think it's because the greeting in verses 1 and 2 is essentially the same as the greeting in, in uh, 1 Timothy. But we will read those verses, of course. We're not going to skip verses 1 and 2. Um, so we will look at all of chapter 1 of 2 Timothy next week and then proceed through to the end of the quarter with 2 Timothy. So let's, I appreciate all the comments today, as always. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for the, the, the Bible. We thank you for these letters we have that Paul wrote Timothy. Father, we thank you for Paul's faith. We thank you for Timothy's faith. Father, we pray that we can realize the distinction between the physical and the spiritual, that we'll realize that we have a better home, that we're heading to a different place. Father, help us to pursue great things, including godliness, ultimately to pursue you and your son and your spirit. And Father, we do pray that we will fight the good fight. And Father, help us at all times to be willing to confess who Jesus is, uh, even when it's a little bit hard or a little bit tough, or we feel we might be persecuted or whatever might, the case may be. Help us to put you first and not worry about uh, what might happen to us. Father, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you for this first letter. And we thank you for the, the spiritual and faith gains that we've been able to have from your riches and your grace. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.